Today we're going to unpack some Bible verses that describe for us a, sort of this a story that Jesus tells to his listeners that reinforces this message that God expects you and he expects me to live our life in a manner that bears legacy fruit. And so I've entitled today's conversation, Legacy Responsibility. Legacy Responsibility. And so in your Bibles, in Luke chapter 19, slide down to verse, uh, let's see, verse 11, thank you, and uh, follow along as I read. Picture the scene in your mind. The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said, and because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. And so Jesus, we're told here, is on his way to Jerusalem. He has just left, if you read the verses before this, the town of Jericho. And the distance between Jericho and Jerusalem is about 17 miles. And so in, in Jesus' day and age, it's about a two-day walk. Now, if you're Jack Lester, you would probably do it in one day. But in Jesus' day, uh, it's about a two-day walk. And people have this impression that when Jesus is coming, they're expecting this uh, messianic sort of uh, rule of law, if you will. They're expecting Jesus to have this messianic earthly kingdom. He's already proven himself to be this amazing healer, amazing teacher. He's done all these great things. And so these Jewish, the Jewish, Jewish nation is expecting that they're going to, as Jesus kind of gets to Jerusalem, he's going to set up, as most of you know, this, this heavenly kingdom here on earth where the Romans get booted out and the Jewish people get back put back at the top of the power uh, food chain, so to speak. And we're told here in verse 11, that, or 12 rather, that Jesus, uh, or I guess I guess it is 11, he's, he's trying to re reestablish and reset kind of the expectations for who he is and why he has come. Okay, so next verse. So Jesus said, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Now stop here for a second. Jesus is giving them, he's sort of doing some foreshadowing of his ministry. Jesus is the nobleman here in, in this story. And he's talking about how the fact that this nobleman is about to be called away to this distant uh, empire to be crowned king. Jesus is subtly telling his listeners that he is about to return to heaven, but they don't catch it. Why? Because their focus is where? Their focus is on here, the here and now. Their focus is on this earthly kingdom. And I identify with that. I don't know if you do or not. But I recognize in my own life, and maybe you do too, that it's easy for me to kind of focus on the here and now and forget sometimes that there's more coming, brothers and sisters. Right. There's, a, there's another kingdom, there's another life for those of us who have given our hearts to Jesus. You know, we have heaven to look forward to, and those who reject Jesus, as we're going to read, or if you read at the very end of the story, they're going to be booted out of the kingdom. They're going to hell, which is not a place I want to be, and maybe you don't either, I hope not. But Jesus is doing this foreshadowing here, and, and, and they're, they're not catching it. Why? Because their, their focus is on the earth, not necessarily this heavenly realm, okay? So he says, this nobleman leaves. He's called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I am gone. Now stop here for a second. Here in Jesus' story, all the servants, they get the exact same amount of, of money, don't they? We're told that there's 10 servants. They all get how many pounds of silver? 10. And they're all expected to invest this money while the nobleman is away. Verse 14. It's good music. Can you hear that? For those of you tuning in online, we have the, we're right on the street here and we can hear what's going on. So, Verse 14. I get easily distracted. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be king. You see the foreshadowing here? Jesus recognizes that not everybody in that day loved, was a Jesus fan. Not everybody, uh, you know, even though Jesus was this great miracle worker, <clears throat> not everybody was on the Jesus bandwagon. And Jesus recognizes this. He recognizes that not everybody is his supporter. But what he also wants his listeners to know is even though these, there are people among his community who don't want him to be king, 
nothing's going to prevent him from being anointed the Holy One, the King of Kings. So let's keep reading. Verse 15. So after he was crowned king, this nobleman, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. Stop here. So this nobleman's now king, right? And as he returns, he calls his ten servants to give an account for how they have invested their ten pounds of silver. This nobleman, or this owner, when he left, he was a nobleman, but now as he returns, he is the king, and he wants to know what kind of profits his servants have produced, right? That's where we're at so far. So write this down, point number one in your app notes. God entrusts to me responsibility. God entrusts to you, and he entrusts to me responsibility. Friends, in this Bible story, Jesus wants his listeners to know, he wants you and me to know that our life is not an amusement park where we buy this ticket, so to speak, to simply entertain ourselves on rides and shows. <laughs> Rather, your life and mine is a carbon mine, and God expects us to grab a shovel and start digging for diamonds. Are you with me? You know, I submit that from the moment that you and I breathe our first breath, that God entrusts to us responsibility. And I love how in this particular story, Jesus calls 10 of his servants together, right? They receive the same amount of, of, of money to invest. Each servant is given again, how many pounds of silver? 10. Okay, now think about this. Personalize this. Do you ever find yourself comparing yourself to others? You know, do you ever look at the house that people live in or the cars that people drive or maybe the clothes that they wear or maybe even the popularity that a person might seem to have and somehow make a value judgment about yourself based upon that house or that car or that clothes or that popularity that you may or may not have or even the size of church that you belong to? Do you compare yourself to others? You do know, don't you, that you have strengths that I don't have and that I have strengths likely that, that you don't have. And you do know that your strengths are not better than my strengths and that my strengths are not better than your strengths. They're just strengths. They're ten talents that God has invested to us, if you will, entrusted to us to invest. You know, you might be great at swimming or, or cooking, Denise, or maybe growing a garden, Rob, and I might be great at riding a motorcycle, playing basketball, and maybe even patting my head by rubbing, while well, rubbing my stomach. You can all do that, right? Let's all practice that. You pat your head. And, Come on, Margaret, let's go. You can all... Listen, Michael, the skills that God has given to you doesn't make you better than me, and the skills that God has given to me, right, doesn't make me better than you. They simply showcase the truth that God entrusts to us, entrusts to each of us, what? Responsibility. We're all given ten talents. And so turn to your neighbor and say, you are special and so am I. You are special and so am I. Friends, God entrusts to all of us responsibility. Let me hear you say out loud the word all. 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 We're all given responsibility. So a second truth that Jesus builds on here in this story, point number two in your, in your notes, is the truth that God uses responsibility to test my trustworthiness. God uses responsibility to test my trustworthiness. Look again at verse 15. So after he was, let's see here. Boy, my eyes are getting bad. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and I made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Amen. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. 
But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and I kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops that you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. I don't know if you've ever had a king roar at you, but I don't think that's probably a very good thing. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man and take, who takes what isn't mine and harvest crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then turning to the other, standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. I'll just keep a couple, we'll just finish this out. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now write this down. Point number three in, in your app notes. God rewards my trustworthiness with more trust. God rewards my trustworthiness with more trust. God entrusts to me responsibility. He uses responsibility to test my trustworthiness. And when I prove to him that I'm a good steward, he will reward my trustworthiness with more trust, which means basically more what? Responsibility. You know, someone once said that there's no such thing as, in the Christian life, as standing still. There's no such thing as standing still in the Christian life. We either get more or lose what we have. We either advance to greater heights or we slip back. So here's a question that I encourage you to ponder. Maybe it's your lunchtime uh, conversation. What keeps you from being trustworthy? What holds you back from being dependable with responsibility? You know, in this story that Jesus tells, what emotion holds back the servant from investing his master's money? What emotion influenced his trustworthiness or lack thereof? Look again at verse 20. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. So give me your feedback. What excuse did the servant give for not investing the king's money? He said, I hid your money and kept it safe because I was what? Afraid. afraid. I was afraid. Would you agree with me when I say that fear can be crippling? Fear, brothers and sisters, can undermine responsibility. So write these three things down in your notes. Letter A, fear will challenge my effort. Fear will challenge my effort. Letter B, fear will challenge my resolve. Fear will challenge my resolve. And then letter C, with God's help, fear can be conquered. Fear can be conquered. Fear will challenge my effort. Fear will, fear will challenge my resolve. But with God's help, fear can be conquered. Friends, in this legacy Bible story, Jesus is teaching us here that God, our Heavenly Father, entrusts to us, to you and me, responsibility. He, and he tests and he expects us to steward well that responsibility. And as we illustrate our ability to steward well what responsibility he gives us, he rewards our trustworthiness with more trust when, now don't miss this, when we swing the bat. You can't hit the ball if you don't swing the bat. And each of us have a specified amount of time here on this earth to do that. You know, for 
those of you who have been around Palm Harvest Church for a season or two, you've likely heard me talk about sort of this, this story. And, and, and I've, there's 10 servants here, right? We're told there's 10 servants that are each received 10 pounds of silver. And yet we read here that when the king calls them in to give an account for how they invested their money, we're only told about the king's interaction with three of the servants. So I always ask the question, what happened to the seven? The other seven that also received 10 pounds of silver. You know, how did they fare with their responsibility investment? Well, the Bible writer doesn't tell us, does he? And so if you've been around here for very long, you've likely heard me say, it's my opinion, and take it for what it's worth, that the seven servants unaccounted for in our story weren't mentioned because they had invested the king's money. They had swung the bat, but they struck out. It's my opinion that they lost it all. Their investments didn't pan out. And I suggest that the reason the king didn't reprimand them like he did the third servant in Jesus' story is because the king was happy that they had at least tried. Even though they swung the bat and missed, even though from the world's perspective and in the world's eyes they failed, my opinion is that in God's eyes, in the king's eyes, they had at least tried. They didn't allow fear to keep them from trying. And sisters and brothers, I encourage you to sit in the tension of Jesus' Bible story. Now on the count of three, let me hear you say the phrase out loud, one life. You ready? One, two, three. One life. Now on the count of three, let me hear you say out loud the phrase, swing the bat. Ready? One, two, three. Swing the bat. We have one life that God has given us to live. And I believe he's calling us to swing the bat. And as God's ambassador standing before you today, I implore you that with God's help, swing the bat. Sisters and brothers in faith, Jesus invites you and me to step out and pursue the dream that God has put on our heart. He's given to you 10 talents. And what those 10 talents or pounds of silver are probably different than what he's given to me. That's what at least I think what the Bible in part teaches us here. Now is pursuing dreams scary? Yes or no? Yes, it can be. Is stepping out, does that sometimes involve risk? Yes or no? Yes. Sure does. And the results that you and I may get, may get may not be tenfold. The results that you and I get when we step out may not even be fivefold. In fact, you and I might lose all of the master's money. But what I'm suggesting is that we honor our king. We honor our king. You honor our king by trying. And so I propose that legacy responsibility is basically living our life with a dependence upon Jesus and a determination to not give in to fear. Jesus says perfect love, or one of the, the Bible says this somewhere, the perfect love casts out fear. I think God's more concerned about whether or not you, you're willing to try and less, and, and, and I guess equally concerned about don't give in to fear. You know, in a moment, we're going to close this conversation with a prayer together. I'm going to call it the Say No to Fear prayer. But before we say this prayer together, I'd like for you, just for a moment, try to identify something in your life. Just kind of cycle through, and maybe for some of you, the, the answer will be really easy. But I'd like for you to try to identify something in your life, maybe right now, that you've been pushing away because it's causing you to feel a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. For example, maybe some of you are on the teeter-totter about making a job change. Boy, how many people do you know who have a job and they hate their job, but they, they stay in it because they're 
fearful of what may happen if they try something else. I've had friends who have stayed in a job for 30, 40 years, and they hated it, but the money was good, and they just got the paycheck, but they just were dying inside. Does fear keep you from venturing out? Or how about this one? Maybe some of you have some toxic people in your life, in your circles. You ever have any, you have any friends who are toxic? And maybe one of the decisions you're trying to wrestle with is, should I walk away? Should I stop being around these people? Should I remove them from my life? Boy, that's tough. That's a tough tension. God's calling me to be a witness, and yet I recognize that the, these people are just, they're bringing me down. I'm kind of fearful of what may happen, and that's especially tough when they're their family members. Is fear keeping you from making a tough choice? You know, maybe some of you here today or watching online have been hurt relationally. Maybe some of you have experienced the, the pain of a divorce or a, a relational breakup. And now you're kind of scared about putting your heart out there again, right? I don't want to put my heart out there. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be burned again relationally. That's a real fear. Would you agree with me on that? Stepping out is risky. The fear of getting hurt again might be holding you back. Or the fear of what other people might think or say might be holding you back. Fears, we all have them. So I'd love for you, before we go into the say no to fear prayer, I'd love for you to just try to figure out what is it that I'm wrestling with right now? What, what is it that I'm afraid of? I've shared with you many times before that I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. God's helping me grow in this. But I've cared way too much for way too long about what other people think. And now I'm just going out there and I'm starting to say stuff. And I'm going to reap the consequences for it, for sure. But what keeps you back? What holds you back from being the person that God has entrusted to you? The responsibility that he has given to you. You know, the things I say are going to have a reflection upon Palm Harvest Church. And if you're a part of Palm Harvest Church family, which you are, it's going to have a reflection upon you. And so I'm careful. I want to be wise and stuff at the same time. But what about you? Okay. God's entrusted to all of us responsibility. And I propose that Jesus is teaching us that legacy responsibility involves saying no to what? Fear. Palms open now. Let's pray a prayer. Palms open. Heart open. Let's take a deep breath together in and just hold it. Exhale. Good. Now pray this to Jesus. Say, Jesus, thank you for this life that you have entrusted to me. Thank you for the responsibilities that you have put into my hand. Please increase my ability to make good decisions. Decisions that produce a positive return for your glory, Jesus. For your glory. So Jesus, tell them this. Say, thank you for this life that you have entrusted to me. Please increase my ability to make good decisions again and help me not to surrender to fear. Help me, Jesus, to live my life with confidence to swing the bat. This is my legacy prayer today. In your name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So brothers and sisters, swing the bat this week. Help each other swing the bat. You know, we're going to go to communion right now. Uh, and is it Joe Elise? Are you going to serve us today? Rick and Nancy are going to serve us. Rick and Nancy are going to be at the back. And communion is, is it's just a, it's such a great reminder. It's the, it reminds us of why Jesus came. 
And as we see in this story, which we un just unpack together, is Jesus came to remind us that there's more to come, but in the meantime, we got work to do. We have people to love. We have communities to positively influence and impact. We have lives to change. And so as you go to the back and as you receive the elements from Rick and Nancy, the bread's going to represent the life that Jesus lived, his call to love our neighbor as ourself. The, the, the cup is going to remind us, filled with grape juice, is going to remind us of God's love for us. And it's a reminder and an invitation that we get to love God in return. And while you go to the back and, and, and sit in that, that truth that Jesus loves you and he is for you and he is with you and he's inviting you and challenging you and really imploring you to live a life with kingdom responsibility and stewardship, also sit in the truth that even when you fail, even when you lose it all, he's, I think, okay with it as long as you give it a go. That's what we call Grace. That's what we call forgiveness. So once you get your elements and you come back, sit in the truth of God's forgiveness and ask him to forgive you for your bad temper. Maybe you said something this last week that you know, pff, boy, that, that could have, I could have said that differently, right? Ask him to change your life. Ask him to forgive your sins and, and to continue to transform you into the person that you want he wants you to be and that you want to be. Ask him to help you to be a good steward and to say no to fear, okay? So as you feel comfortable, David's going to play. He's going to sing probably a little bit too. Go to the back, get your elements, come back and sit down. For those of you who are at home and if you want to run in the kitchen right now, if you can, grab a, some, you know, piece of bread or, you know, whatever. Just some elements that represent those two things. Sit in that truth and then together we will take communion together. Sound good? So let me pray real quick, and then we'll, I'll release you. So Lord, thank you for what you did for us, Jesus. Oh, man. You gave your life up so we could have forgiveness. What an amazing thing that is. Oh. And Lord, today some of us need that forgiveness maybe more than others. And so as we come to you with the hearts of gratitude... As we expose our heart and say, wow, Lord, will you forgive me? Thank you for the truth of your Bible that teaches us that you will. And so as we sit in this time of worship, as we sit in this time of communion, this conversation with you and ourselves, our heart, even in this moment, God, we pray you would transform us. Amen. Get up and go to the back as you feel so wet.